Welcome back to another Bible study on heaven that we've been going through together. Uh, it's my privilege to be back to teach you. Um, it is Saturday night ag again, this evening when I am recording this. So I apologize for those of you who looked for it earlier and it's not there. Um, but have you noticed those of us in Birmingham and probably maybe anywhere in the Southeast, we had a heat wave today. It got up to 31, I think. But that's considerably warmer than it was first of this week when we had snow and ice. Enough ice that it broke my windshield. Hmm. But anyway, today um, for our lesson, we are actually talking about those kind of things. The sun, the moon, the oceans, the weather, uh, while we're considering heaven. So anyway, I, I think maybe it will just be enough to give us a fascination for our afterlife. Um, which is what we've been talking about anyway in the new heaven and the new earth that's just ahead of us. But we're going to, I'm going to read just a few verses to you, and then we'll pray before we jump into the lesson. But do you remember in Genesis 1-1, a lot of people can't get past Genesis 1-1 to believe in God. But it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Um, Isaiah 65, 17 says this, um, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. That's Isaiah 65, 17. Right before that, it's talking about the troubles. All of the troubles, all of the things that would make us sad, God will wipe away our tears. And, and this week, um, in reading a commentary on that that I like to go to, was talking about, can you imagine Jesus actually taking his hands and wiping the tears from your eyes? Uh, and it was just so touching to even think about that. We know that he cares for us, that he carries us in his heart engraved on his hands but to think that he would be the one wiping the tears away and he very well may be we know that he personally comes for us at the rapture um, when we meet our loved ones in the air but new heaven and new earth we know that it's in revelation but it's other places in the bible too which is fascinating to me isaiah 66 22 says this for as the new heavens and the new earth which i will make shall remain before me saith the lord so shall your seed and your name remain. So it talks about new heavens and new earth. And he says, your, you and your seed shall remain. Your children, the, the children that you've brought into the world, that you've given them the gospel, they've accepted Christ. He's also their God. Your seed will remain. Uh, 2 Peter 3.13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Aren't we looking for that? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hmm. Go for those days. And then, of course, Revelation 21, 1 and 2, the verses we're most familiar with about new heaven and new earth. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And so we'll just have a word of prayer, and then we're going to talk about just some questions that arise when we consider what's just ahead for eternity about the sun and moon and oceans and weather and all of those kind of things. So let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the privilege to open your word, to have the freedom to do that. Lord, we thank you for all of the little nuggets of truth that you've hidden for us in the scriptures about a lot of what we can expect. We don't know exactly how everything will, will be, but there are so many uh, hints and clues and, and treasures that you've given to us, just things to think about and to excite us about the days ahead that you have planned for us. We thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for giving us the privilege to love you and learn you and serve you and all of those things. I pray that you might bless the few minutes that we have together now as we glean from your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So just to answer some questions that arise uh, along these lines that we're talking about, one of the questions that comes up is what kind of light will there be on the new earth? And uh, we know, of course, that God will be the light, and that will be the brightness that we need. We know the light in Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, will never go out because God's presence is there. Uh, but think about this. Let's just kind of um, come now, let us reason together. Uh, you remember that um, there was um, light even before God created the sun and the moon. If you were to go back to Genesis um, chapter 1, it talks about and God said, let there be light. The question came up this week in the in-house Bible study. Could that be the Shekinah glory of God that's just shining? Like You can just picture God stepping out um, to create the earth. And he said that he created earth to be inhabited 
by mankind. He had all of the galaxies, all of the whole world. He created the earth for us, and the scriptures are clear on that. And I love that. It was a gift to us. Um, but God said, let there be light, and there was light. It could have been from his Shekinah glory. At the same time, he gave the command, let there be light, and there was light. But then I think it's down in verse 14, that's when he made the sun and the moon, the, the greater light, the lesser light. I will throw in right here that men and women have been compared to greater light, lesser light, with the man being the greater, the woman being the lesser. But it is a reminder that the lesser light, the moon, is the one that controls the tides. So anyway, God's plan is good. The way he made it, the way he put everything in order, the way he wanted it um, to be. But the verse that comes to mind about there not being sun or moon is Revelation 21, 23. It says that the city had no need of the sun. And I would just emphasize, we, we don't know. The sun may or may not be hanging in the sky, but it says no need of sun. We wouldn't need the sun, perhaps. Uh, Revelation 22, 5 says there's no night there. Uh, Isaiah 60, 19 and 20, though, just referencing just different things to kind of give us clues to what it might be. Revelation, uh, I mean, excuse me, Isaiah 60, verses 19 and 20, it says this, The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and the God of thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down. So the sun is is present in Isaiah chapter 60. It said we didn't need the sun, but in verse uh, 20 of Isaiah 60, it says the sun shall no more go down. So the sun is there, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. The moon will not withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. So anyway, just some thoughts there, just on the light. Um, we know there are different, there are variances to light. People prefer different intensities of light, that kind of thing. Um, but when I think about this, about there always being light in New Jerusalem, in the holy city that comes down, it just reminds you of a city that never sleeps. Have you ever been to one of those cities? I, I think, um, just humanly speaking, what we can compare it to, New York City is like that. You can go about it any time of the night and find places open to shop and to have coffee and all of those kind of things. It's a city that never sleeps. I'm sure I've probably heard the same thing about Las Vegas, um, maybe even Chicago. I'm not sure. But anyway, not to compare something so spiritual as the New Jerusalem with any of those places, but I'm just saying there are cities that seemingly never sleep. And I think there will be so much activity going on in the New Jerusalem. And we know it will be constant light. It'll just be constant activity probably going on there. It's just fascinating to think about. So what about outside the city of New Jerusalem? Um, God created the first celestial heavens to display his glory. Psalm 19, one through three says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Um, so all over the world, besides the New Jerusalem, outside the city, it talks about the kings of the earth will bring their glory into, into the New Jerusalem. So many thoughts to unpack right there. But another question that arises is if the world is full of light in eternity, does that mean we won't see any more sunrises or sunsets? So I'm curious. I asked the ladies Thursday, what do you like better, the sunrise or the sunset? And some of the ladies said they, they never see the sunrise. <laughs> okay, um, but anyway, they're beautiful. And depending on where you live, you can see for miles sometimes if you're not, if, it's, if the sun is not blocked by buildings or something like that. I always think it would be so awesome on Easter Sunday mornings. Uh, we've been to many sunrises, sunrise services. If you could just see the sun rise over the horizon, we always would meet at nighttime. I mean, early, early morning, like when Mary Magdalene went to the garden. Uh, and then to watch the sun rise up on the crosses that we had um, at, at the church in the yard. It's just fascinating to see that and to think about it. Uh, let's see. So sunrises and sunsets, that we're, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I would keep in mind that the sun and moon we were just reading about in Isaiah, the sun and moon are just light holders. They would have held no light if God had not commanded them to hold light. That Verse 19, the sun... Verse 20, the sun shall 
be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness, but it says that the sun won't go down, the moon won't, won't dissipate, disappear. Uh, you remember in John chapter 1, it said that Jesus is the light of the world. So a lot of brightness um, on, the, on the new earth for sure. Okay, next question. Will there be seasons and varying weather? I will say I'm a cloud watcher. I have a lot of pictures on my phone of clouds. Monica and I or Meredith and I can be riding down the road and I'll pull out my phone and take a picture because I love all of the different shapes of the clouds, kinds of clouds. I love it when light comes through the clouds or I even have pictures like a little video uh, of clouds and you can see the lightning popping inside the clouds. It's just fascinating. And I'm reminded this week we had snow here. You probably had snow where you are too. It seems like a lot of the country did. And I'm reminded that the Bible refers to um, God holding the treasures of the snow and then releasing it. So anytime we talk about weather, the wind, all of those kind of things, God is in that. He's the one who directs that. He's the one who holds that. Um, some people have never thought about heaven's weather because they don't really picture um, heaven as being a real place. We know that where our loved ones are right now is the present heaven, but we do know that heaven is going to come down. For new heaven, new earth, God's going to create. Uh, some people assume the new earth will have bright sunshine, no clouds, no rain. However, Ezekiel chapter 34, let me see if I have that right here. Um, I had a couple of things in Ezekiel I wanted to read to you. Let's see. Let me get to chapter 34. Give me just one second. Ezekiel 34, verses 26 and 27. It says, And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the, the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. Haven't you heard that before? Somebody, I think, wrote a song about that uh, for sure. Verse 27 says, And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. And they shall be safe in their land and shall know that I am the Lord. Um, then he goes on to say all of the things. They'll know that I'm the Lord when I have done all of these things. And he lists other things. Uh, is rain a bad thing? No, rain is a good thing. Uh, there, we do know this. There will be trees bearing fruit um, on the new earth. So we can presume maybe that there will be rain that waters um, those trees. Could rain turn to snow in higher elevations? Why not? Yeah, it's just speculation, a lot of it. We don't know for sure exactly. But um, I love all of the seasons. Acts 14, verse 17 says this, Nevertheless, he, Jesus, left not himself without witness, and that he did good. Yeah, the Bible says Jesus went about doing good. I love that. I try to make that my goal to do the same thing. And gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. It's just his desire to give good things to his people. I love that verse. That's Acts 14, uh, 17, if you're making a note of that. So rain isn't a bad thing. We know that we need it, and it's a gift. Um, in the Old Testament, you might recall, a lot of times when there was no rain, the kings fretted over that. They had to figure out a solution to that because they knew that God had withheld that from them. Uh, but don't you just love all of the seasons? And that's what Acts 14, 17 is talking about there, that it was just something that Jesus gave to us, for our, to the people, for, for his, their own gladness, their own goodness, their own, for their good and um, gladness. Um, the long goodbye to summer, the snow and winter, all the things that come to life in the spring. Don't you love the spring? We love the seasons, and God made the seasons. There's not really a reason to assume that he would just completely do away with that. I think there will be some evidence of that and things that we can enjoy. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 24 and 25. These, these verses are interesting. It says, Let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things. So the only reason they would not be extended is just because of iniquity, which we, will not, we know will not be present on the new earth. It says your sins have withheld these good things from you. So uh, these these are good, are good things. Uh, we'll go to Ezekiel 47. I tried to go to just a second ago in just a minute. But one of the confusing and to many people disappointing thoughts is that on the new earth there will be no more sea. Um, some people are beach kind of people. Uh, but what exactly does that mean? And I'd like for us to reference Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Let me get there. 
Revelation 21, 1 says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And so that's the verse that a lot of people go to. But then if you keep reading one chapter more, chapter 22, verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. Sounds like the Garden of Eden. There was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. I know a lot of people say there won't be any time there, but it's talking about the months, yeah, yielding her fruit. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I think the fruit probably would be okay to eat. And the leaves would be for the healing of the nations. I'm reminded all the time there must be a lot of things that would be for our healing now. And we do know of some of them, of course. Aloe vera, if you burn yourself, those kind of things. We do know that there are things like that um, in leaves and plants. But even more so, probably on the new earth, we'll find out there were all kinds of things. If we had just known, had figured that out. Uh, so a river flows down the middle of that great street of New Jerusalem, and it, it flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Um, so there will be water. Yeah, so don't despair. There will be water. But back in Bible days and in early civilizations, the sea was a very scary thing. Now, I will say this. The, ski, the sea is scary, but even lakes are scary at nighttime. Yeah, in the daytime, they look inviting when the sun's shining on them, and we love that. At nighttime, it's a totally different story. So there will be no night there. Won't that be great? Uh, so no need to be scared. And the sea divides. It divides nations and countries and continents. If you actually take a world map, if you were to try to push all of the things on the world map together, it's almost as if the land just connects with itself. And so no more sea. That's the salt water, maybe. a lot. Think of all the things that have happened in the sea. Ships have gone down. So many people have gone down with the ships. Um, a lot of violence out in the middle of the sea, middle of the ocean. So just a thought there. There will be water there. And it says that it will flow out from the throne. Zechariah 14, 8 says this, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. And in summer and in winter it shall be. Um, the question has arisen, how deep is this water? Um, the book of Revelation doesn't really say how deep that water is, but Ezekiel might give us just a little bit of an idea. Uh, Ezekiel 47 that I was referencing a minute ago. Uh, it says this in verse 3 of Ezekiel 47. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. You can go back and read the context of all of this. It's fascinating, and it's what um, is being shown. Verse 4, again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees, so to the ankles, to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters to the loins. Okay, getting up. Uh, to the waist. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. So perhaps this is how it will be for the river flowing from the throne um, in the New Jerusalem. Uh, I will make a spiritual application here. We know there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible, but it has been likened to that passage. We can, a lot of things we can make additional applications to, but a lot of things we should just take literally the way God put it in the Bible. I don't think he intended for it to be difficult for us to understand what he was trying to say, but symbolically, uh, the Christian life can be likened to the same thing. Do you remember when you first got saved? I was saved at the age of four, not quite five, almost there. But at the age of four, I didn't know any deep theology. I really didn't. I, I believed that God was in heaven and that Jesus died for my sins. And I wanted to go there. And I did not want to go to hell. And so I didn't know a lot at the age of four. But I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And so that would be ankle deep um, knowledge, ankle deep knowledge. But as I kept walking with the Lord, I'm almost 67. So... 63 years almost I've been saved and I've just continued to walk with the Lord and to learn him more to um, live for him so from ankle deep knowledge to the knees keep going to the loins 
and then it's a river that you can swim in. There is so much in the Bible, and if you just dig deep to learn all that you want to learn, you never would exhaust everything that's there for you to learn. It's like waters to swim in. You just enjoy it. It's, you're covered with knowledge of God. I remember one time uh, in a Bible study a few years back, a, a visitor had come in, a lady who was visiting, and somehow in the conversation, people were talking about different stories in the Bible and, and their thoughts on it. Anyway, just in casual conversation we were having, a lot of Old Testament stories, you know, just making those connections and that kind of thing. And finally, this lady who was the visitor spoke up. She said, how do you know? How do you all know these things? Yeah, that's just walking with the Lord and learning Him. It's fascinating. But anyway, just a little bit of a spiritual, deeper application there to Ezekiel chapter 47. Um, so water is significant. It's all through the Bible. Our bodies are made up of a lot of water. Um, I don't recall how much. Is it 50%? More than 50%. But anyway, so water is important even for our well-being. Um, Psalm 46, 4 says this, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. Uh, Isaiah 12, 3 says this. The book of Isaiah says, We'll have joy in drawing from the wells of salvation. And God invites the thirsty to come to the waters at no cost in Isaiah 55, 1. But do you remember also in the New Testament when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well? He offers her water. He says, If you'll take of this water, you'll never thirst again. And so water is very, very important. Okay. And so for the last question for this Bible study, will we miss things from the old earth? Um, well, I'm going to liken it to this. If you have ever flown on a plane, you probably have flown in economy class just as I have, and perhaps you have also flown in first class. There's a world of difference, isn't there? And there's something about being on that plane whenever they, if you're sitting in the economy side at, at some particular time, depending on what price you can get on the ticket, right? Uh, and then they pull that curtain to separate the first class from the economy class. Don't you always think, Okay, we see you up there. We're right here. Um, so back in the economy class section, the seat is not as comfortable. You only have a choice of peanuts or pretzels to eat. They really should fix that. Surely there is something else. Um, maybe those little cheddar fish things or something. I don't know. Oh, maybe some people can't eat cheese. Anyway, peanuts and pretzels back there in economy class. But in first class, all kinds of things. You actually get a meal. They start serving you whatever you want to drink. As soon as you sit down, the seats are much more plush and much more comfortable. Now they even make them so that you can, like like a bed that makes out almost, you can stretch out full length and take a nap and sleep on the whole flight. Such a difference between economy and first class. So I know that's just a human illustration there. But imagine how much different the new earth is going to be from the present earth. Yeah, it's going to be like moving forward from the economy or from the baggage compartment, uh, baggage compartment, baggage, the baggage compartment to first class and beyond. We can't even fathom all that God has prepared for us. Um, you know, on in first class, the flight attendants keep filling your cup. Don't you know our cups are just going to be filled to overflowing whenever we're in eternity? Um so the upgrade from the old earth to the new earth will be vastly superior to that from economy to first class. Um, we'll experience, this is what Ephesians 2, 7 says, and you've heard me reference it before. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It says that God is going to spend the ceaseless ages of eternity showing us his kindness. So all of the things that we could kind of get bogged down on, like, oh, I, I hope we can see sunrises and sunsets, and I hope there's water, and I just love being around water, and all of those things that we think of where we are now on the present earth, oh, God has so many things uh, better than we can even comprehend uh, prepared for us for what's just ahead. It behooves us to develop a fascination for our afterlife, which is what we've been talking about here. We still have um, a couple of lessons in this series. We've talked about all kinds of things, but we still want to talk about a, a few more things, music and things like that in heaven. Can you imagine the sights and sounds and all of that of heaven? Uh, we also are going to mention, before we finish this series, rewards. What kind of rewards will God be giving? And how do we get those rewards waiting for us? How do we have them waiting for us? 
Um, and it's very interesting. I hope you'll join me next week and the week after on the Heaven series, and then we'll probably change series, and I'm looking forward to that too, and hope you'll join me. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had. You've blessed us so much, and we're so grateful. Lord, thank you for opening um, our eyes to your word and the truths and treasures that you have hidden there, that you'd give us understanding and clarity of thoughts on all of these things, Lord. Presently, we're just fascinated with all of the things you have planned for us, and we love learning about that, and we thank you for that. Bless each person who's listening their day, if it's this evening or tomorrow or whenever they're able to listen. I pray that you might bless them, give them good days ahead. I pray that they would feel your presence and know that. And we'll thank you for it. It's in Jesus' sweet and precious name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you. Hope to see you next week.